Today's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21 in the New Testament. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, surrounded by signs of fire, wind, and a variety of languages in their midst, the people were amazed and astonished at Jesus' promise coming true. The reading begins at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. cuando llegó el día de Pentecostés, estaban todos juntos en el mismo lugar. De repente vino del cielo un ruido como el de una violenta ráfaga de viento y llenó toda la casa donde estaban reunidos. Se les aparecieron entonces unas lenguas como de fuego que se repartieron y se posaron sobre cada uno de ellos. Todos fueron llenos del Espíritu Santo y comenzaron a hablar en diferentes lenguas según el Espíritu les concedía expresarse. Estaban de vista All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. 
Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of Pentecost is a strange one. Unlike any other in the Bible, really, a powerful wind, the appearance of fire-like tongues atop the heads of each believer gathered there, a mysterious communication that allows them to speak their own language, and yet it's heard by people who speak a different language, and then, lest we forget, a powerful sermon by Peter that uh, pierces the hearts of his listeners, many of whom had condemned Jesus to death or yelled for his crucifixion just a few weeks earlier. It's a dramatic story, he tells, and it's not really a celebration. That's kind of the way we treat it. It's a celebration because we're looking back and we call it the birthday of the church. We remember that as Christians were given the Holy Spirit, that there is the Spirit of God. But I can't help but think that for the people that went through this, it's more like a before and after event, uh, a new reality, a new normal, so to speak, only instead of social distancing, people experience a remarkable coming together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This morning, I'd like for us to consider four signs and wonders of that day. Each one actually points to what it means for God's Spirit to be poured out upon us. They aren't important in of themselves. They're important in terms of what they teach, what they point, what makes this giving of the Holy Spirit absolutely memorable and uh, something that the believers of that time would never forget. Wind, flames, communication, and a new vision of humanity preached by Peter. The wind. It says about 120 followers of Jesus are meeting in a, must have been a somewhat large upper room. They seem to have been expecting something to happen because Jesus had promised that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And it's a gathering of <clears throat> men and women, the disciples there, sure. We would probably imagine a somewhat younger crowd, people in their teens, their 20s, their 30s, a lot. Um, and now suddenly there is this unexpected rush of wind. It's the sound is a roar, but it's not engulfing the whole city. It's basically localized on their upper room. And um, why wind? Well, Bob Dylan wrote that we don't need a weatherman to tell us which way the wind blows, but we do learn from meteorologists what causes it to blow and where it comes from. That's just something recent. In ancient times, the fascinating thing about the wind was, it was a mystery. Jesus once said, where it goes, where it comes from and where it goes, we do not know. And for this reason, the Hebrew word for wind is also used for God's spirit, the breath of life, and in this case, it's a sign of the presence or a coming of the Holy Spirit. Invisible, but there. Oh boy, you know it when it's really there. It's not hard to picture. Just this last week, I'm looking out at this magnificent, large maple tree with its full leaves now. And there's quite a wind. And it is twisting and turning and buffeting this magnificent tree. And you realize how powerful is the wind. Or if you've ever canoed around a point when you're going against the wind, 
and you've had that experience of having to paddle as hard as you can, you can't rest, otherwise you'll go backwards. And there are even points where you wonder if you're making any progress. And uh, once you paddle in the uh, BWCA, you always know where the wind's coming from. So wind has that kind of an effect because it's a power. You can't see it, but there it is. Why this sign? Well, it gets everybody's attention. God's spirit is a power. It has a gravitas. It can give life. It can leave life too. It's mysterious and we can't control it. And yet here it's being given to a community of Jesus. And it's a reminder that God is with us. The second sign is that strange tongue of fire. This event has just begun. It's like the wind is an introduction, but now an even stranger phenomenon happens. A flame-like tongue atop uh, each one of the believers. Just for that day, what does it mean? I think we can get this rather quickly if we think about it because Fire has always been a symbol of the presence of God in, in uh, human culture, but, but think about how we use it. You're watching your, uh, your high school basketball team and uh, you've never seen them play this way before. Inspired, playing together like a force. They uh, seem to make all of their shots. The opposition is calling timeouts to slow things down, but it's no use. Shots on the mark, pressure defense causing turnovers, steals, stolen balls. The big men seem to be playing above the rim. The crowd is going nuts. And you'll say often, they're on fire. And they are. They're inspired, aren't they? That's one of the words we use. We say somebody is hot. One preacher said that the difference between a conviction behind a sermon and just a well-crafted series of words is the difference between lightning and a firefly. This fire inspires and it purifies like metal Peter's sermon, as I said, would pierce the hearts of those who had crucified Jesus, a refining fire in guilty hearts, singeing them with the truth that they finally utter. What shall we do? We have sinned. And then after receiving the grace of Jesus Christ, coming to experience perhaps another kind of fire, but it's a, it's a warmth. It's a burning of something that has been given. Peace, forgiving love. So you have wind and you have fire, but now you have a, a very strange communication. How do you understand something spoken in a foreign language, but you understand it? The disciples don't even hardly realize that's happening. But those that are starting to gather to see what's all of this commotion, because Jerusalem's a crowded city at the time, and they're kind of spilling out into the courtyards, we might imagine, they all understand what the disciples are saying as they are testifying to their faith and giving praise to God. So what does it mean that the message of Jesus that's spoken in a different language is suddenly understood by everyone. This too is a sign and it points to how God's Spirit of God's Spirit moves across barriers, walls, divisions. The Gospels for all people, not just insiders. And so when the Lord sends out people to witness to the faith. There's this forward movement that's willing to cross boundaries 
sometimes at great danger to be able to express the gospel in a way, in a language that its new hearers can understand. One story told by, was told me by my friend Owen, dear friend, pastor, somewhat of a genius in languages, actually. His uh, daughter lives in Dillingham, Alaska. They go up there and spend three weeks at a time, and Owen uh, loves to poke around in old churches with old books, and uh, he told me something that he discovered. He happened upon a very old Russian Orthodox church which, as you remember, before the United States bought Alaska, it actually was a territory of Russia. And um, a beloved priest, whose name is St. Benjamin, and I do not know his last Russian name, uh, reached out to the native Alut population with the gospel. They had no written language. And this has been done quite frequently, that the language then uh, was listened to carefully and formed along with its grammar and written. Uh, St. Benjamin really wrote their language so that he could translate it into the Bible, but he didn't have a word for forgiveness, nothing that communicated the kind of forgiveness of sins that comes for Jesus, where once it's forgiven, it, it, it's gone, it disappears. So. What he did is what all people do when you're learning another's language. You sit at the feet of the culture. You pay attention to how they express things, what they do, what they name them. And he discovered that in the fall when they would be cleaning uh, after a great big hunting and fishing expedition preparing for the winter, and they're cleaning all of these animals, and of course there's offal that is smelly and you want to get rid of it and you don't want to leave it around camp because that's just going to draw bears and all kinds of things there. He discovered that they had a practice in which they found a place by the side of the ocean in which if you threw the offal into the ocean rather than wash ashore or even float, there was an undercurrent that would suck it under and take it out to sea and they would never see it again. And so they had a clean camp. And that's the word, the alut word, that St. Benjamin used to describe in the Bible the forgiveness of God, the forgiveness of sins by Christ. And that has been part of the DNA of, of Christians since the outset. You're constantly moving to try to express in a manner in which those that don't know can understand the gospel, because that's where the Spirit of God leads us. And then there's a fourth sign, and that came in St. Peter's, uh, in Peter's uh, sermon, but I just want you to just think about this for a second because it's really quite astonishing. Seven weeks or so earlier, Peter had been in a courtyard of the high priest the night of Jesus' arrest and had panicked when, uh, when a, a servant uh, suggested that he knew Christ and was one with one, was one, with one of them. Uh, he became afraid and he protested. And when it happened the third time, he even cursed that he did not even know Christ. And then when the cock crew and he left, he bitterly watched all of his self-confidence and self-reliance uh, shattered at the betrayal of his friend. And here he is seven weeks later, and there's been an amazing change that's taken place in him and he stands up and he gives a sermon that is so compelling that he has people that had once shouted for Jesus' death asking what they can do to be saved. And 
in a sense, it's the beginning of the church, a beginning of a new humanity that reaches across the barriers, across the sins, and uh, sees the head as Jesus. Now, oh, this is really a, a remarkable thing, and it's and and and, and what I want to know is you to know is that yes, all of these signs you know, they don't happen over and over again. They're not part of it, but they point to what is true about the work of the Spirit in our lives, and it has been through the ages, continues to this day. the The wind reminds us of God's power and. Sometimes we don't notice it. Sometimes it's done very quietly, but sometimes it literally blows across a nation. We're reminded of the burning of the Spirit in the sense that the Spirit accompanies our whole lives and the dross of our lives is often burned out. So sometimes that fire is almost one of struggle. Other times it's one of uh, joy and a sense of being loved but it's God's presence with us to call us in deeper into this relationship with Christ. And also that sense of wanting to reach out, of wanting to cross some of these borders, something that I know has been very, very important in the life of Bethlehem. And then to remember too, that the word, the message of Jesus is given great power it has the power to cross great distances and reach the human heart and bring it into change. So be encouraged. We live in times that are discouraging. Uh, we notice people that seem, for one reason or another, to, to tread, to give themselves to the lie to spreading dissension, polarity, suspicion. Perhaps it's to control, who knows? And that seems to be so overwhelming. Be encouraged just to know that the Spirit of God has a very different agenda and it is working and it will prevail and that we are invited to be part of that work. Now that is something worth celebrating and remembering. Amen.